So good afternoon, good Friday afternoon, people of God. And I say that because this is our usual Good Friday 3 p.m. in the afternoon service, 3 p.m., because that is the hour at which Jesus dies on the cross for us. We would normally, in normal times, have about 25 to 30 people who would worship at this 3 o'clock service. So with it being recorded now as it is, uh, everyone gets the privilege of worship, worshiping together in the 3 o'clock Good Friday afternoon service. How about that? Another hidden blessing in COVID-19. Secondly, I have some exciting things. Well, I think it is. Uh, I've given Josh a 2007 video of our Living Last Supper that we did here 13 years ago. I have also given Josh a 2015 Good Friday Night Tenebrae service as well. Now, in that 2000, and he's going to try and get them both posted and uh, up for you to view and to enjoy, and I can promise you, you will enjoy viewing both of those. Uh, as you view the 2007 Living Last Supper, you will be amazed at how well it came off and how nice of a job our guys did as they uh, reenacted the characters, uh, the disciples in the upper room. Uh, it'll be fun to check out Craig Sanders, who doesn't have a stitch of gray hair on his head back then. Or Josh Rucker, who was about 35 pounds lighter then, if you could imagine that. Or a Kyle Coker, who hadn't changed a bit. But anyway, take a look at the 2007 Living Last Supper. It's a very, very nice presentation. And then in the 2015 Good Friday Night Tenebrae, Richard is directing our choirs and our orchestra characters, that is, members of the congregation, reenact the events of a Good Friday. And then very, it has a very dramatic finish, the 2015 does, as they all do. Uh, you will like it. Uh, Carol Pickett finishes with the solo, singing the solo, Were You There? Finally, as we follow this service this afternoon, follow uh, as you have been. The, Josh is doing a great job of getting the services on our screens. Um, after the Good Friday prayer, then you see behind me uh, the, seven, the seven candles uh, representing the seven times Jesus speaks from the cross. I will read those words in the order that he spoke them. After each set of words, while you sing a couple of verses of the hymn, uh, that will be there for you, and Josh will lead you with uh, singing those two verses of each hymn that follows. I'll extinguish a candle, and then after the seven candles extinguished, I'll read the final words where Joseph uh, requests for the permission for the body of Jesus. He's placed into the tomb. We'll whisper the Lord's Prayer together. We'll sing two verses of Were You There? And then the final event of our worship service is the slamming of the book, referred to as the Strepitus, which represents the Good Friday earthquake, the closing of the tomb of Jesus and the clash between God and Satan. We ask our blessing on a Good Friday afternoon worship together. Would you please stand? We open with our sentences. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Fellow redeemed, there were many people watching our Lord as he finished the course he was determined to follow. His eyes set on the cross before him. Few of the onlookers could understand what was happening, but none of them dissuaded him from doing his Father's will, and he did it for us. When a woman anointed him with precious oil, the disciples complained, why was this ointment wasted like this? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. Jesus said, she has anointed my body beforehand for burial. When Jesus announced that one of the twelve would betray him, they said to him, 
Is it I? He said to them, For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him. When he told the disciples to watch and pray, they fell asleep and did not know what to answer him. But he said, It is enough. The hour has come. When he said that they would all fall away, Peter said to him, Even though they all fall away, I will not. Jesus said to Peter, Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. When the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Jesus said, I am. When Pilate asked him, Are you the King of the Jews? Jesus answered him, You have said so. When Jesus and the disciples were eating the Passover meal, he revealed to them, Take, this is my body, this is my blood of the covenant. And when he was on the cross and the leaders mocked him, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. He cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Today, let us fix our eyes on the cross and realize with the centurion that Truly, this man was the Son of God. Remain standing, if you'd like, for our opening hymn, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. For a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. My gracious Master and my God, assist me to proclaim to spread through all the earth abroad the honors of his name. Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrow cease. Tis music in the sinner's ears, tis life and health and peace. He breaks the power of cancelled sin, He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean, His blood avails for me. Look unto Him, ye nations own, Your God, ye fallen race. Look and be saved through faith alone, be justified by grace. See all your sins on Jesus laid, the Lamb of God was slain. His soul was once an offering made for every soul of man. To God all glory, praise, and love be now and ever give. By saints below and saints above, the church in earth and heaven. As you are standing, we now receive do confession and receive God's absolution we have to look up to see Jesus on the cross where we see the full measure of God's love but our Heavenly Father looks down to where his son gives himself as the ultimate sacrifice the son looks down on us with full forgiveness and the spirit opens our eyes to the salvation won for us with such awful payment made on our behalf let us freely go to our loving God, confessing our sins, and take a moment of silence for reflection and self-examination. Gracious Heavenly Father, together 
we would rather cover our sins from you, our neighbors, and ourselves. But nothing is hidden from your eyes, exposed in our sinful condition, and unable to save ourselves. We plead for your mercy and forgiveness. Our thoughts, words, and deeds are stained with sin, but because we are confident that your Son's blood washes them clean, we dare to ask that your Holy Spirit lift our eyes to the cross, our hearts to your will, and our minds to a new determination to serve you with all the strength you provide. Although creation itself mourned to see the Lord of life on the cross, the sun darkened and tombs rent open, on the third day the rising sun would reveal that Almighty God had accepted payment for all of our sins and that eternal life is open to us. As your pastor, I joyfully announce that your sins are forgiven. I make that announcement in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray responsively together. Lord God Almighty, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, so strengthen our faith this day that we may fix our eyes on Jesus, ignore the views of this fallen world, and see with clarity your love for us and all mankind. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for our Good Friday readings. The Old Testament reading for this Good Friday afternoon comes from Isaiah chapter 52, beginning at verse 13, and reading through Isaiah 53, verse 12. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up, and shall be exalted. As many were astounded at you, his appearance was so marred, beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shut their mouths because of him, for that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. He who has believed what he has heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground he had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hid their faces as he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him, the chastisement that brought us peace was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned, everyone, to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. But like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off off the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of many people. And they made his grave with the wicked, and with a rich man in his death. Although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring, and he shall prolong his days. 
The will of the Lord shall prosper his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoiled with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. This is the Good Friday word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading, the epistle reading, is recorded in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning at verse 14 and reading through verse 21. Paul writes, for the, love of, for the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded that this, that one has died for all. Therefore, all have died, and he died for all, that those who might no longer live for themselves, but live for him who died for their sake, and died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us this ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God, making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. This, too, is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel as it is recorded in the Gospel of St. Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry the cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he didn't take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha! You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priest with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross, that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanding, bystanders, having heard it, said, Behold, he's calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. When the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. This is the Gospel of the Lord. 
Praise to you, O Christ. Now for one last time in this Lenten season, here on Friday of Holy Week, we sing together the theme hymn that was written for this series, Our Eyes Behold the Savior's Face. Behold the Savior's face. Like I said, the last time we'll get to sing that particular hymn during this Lenten season, I noticed as I was singing it for the last time, um, it really uh, it really goes well with today's message, and it's gone well, I think, with the six midweek Lenten messages as well. So, oh, you can be seated if you're still standing. It's one of my shorter sermons for the midweek series, actually. Eyes on the cross for Good Friday. Makes sense, I suppose. It's been during this six-week midweek Lenten series that our sermons and our messages have focused on various characters that were involved in the passion of Jesus. Our worship theme has remained constant. Fix our eyes on Jesus. And in doing so, we fixed our eyes on Jesus through the eyes of passion characters, such as Judas, Peter, the chief priest and the scribes, the Jewish crowd, Pontius Pilate, Roman soldiers, and others. That's because seeing Jesus through their eyes, we can possibly maybe identify with the characters of the passion, and in doing so, then gain a better understanding of what was going through their minds and why they reacted the way they did to certain parts of Jesus' passion. And it was a good process for us to go through, I think. Because as we did, we took a look-see at ourselves to see how we were like or unlike the people who actually saw Jesus in the flesh and actually firsthand experienced his passion. It also makes the passion of Jesus so much more meaningful to us, which is certainly one important purpose of the whole Lenten season. Now, I hope and pray that this has been another meaningful Lenten season for all of us, not just because of the COVID-19 pandemic crisis, 
but because we indeed really have been fixing our eyes on Jesus. This afternoon, we find ourselves standing at the foot of Good Friday's cross. We stand alongside of others who stand beneath that cross on that first Good Friday. We stand among such characters as Simon of Cyrene, the people who mocked Jesus, and the centurion. They all had their eyes pretty much fixed on Jesus. They would all have a certain view of Jesus' crucifixion. And you know, as we've been going through the Lenten seri uh, midweek series, I almost chose one of these characters here today as the main part of my message. Then I got to thinking, okay, so I did Simon the Cyrene last Palm Sunday, so that was recently done, and actually looking up at Jesus while he's on the cross through the eyes of the centurion is very intriguing. So much so that for this Easter sunrise service, I wrote a centurion monologue. I almost thought about doing that on this Good Friday afternoon, but I said, nah, I'd have to rework it a little bit. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to save the Centurion monologue, perhaps for next year's Easter sunrise service. That way I'll have something prepared. And I thought, you know what would really be, I think, worth reviewing, maybe even interesting and intriguing? If somehow, and only, if only just a little bit, we view what happened on Good Friday's cross through God's eyes. That's right. So what was it that God the Father saw? He looked down from heaven. Jesus is on the cross, and he looks both up to his Father in heaven and down upon us. What all did he see? And... Where was the Holy Spirit through all of this? What did he see? What did he do? In other words, a better question might, do, might be, so what did the three persons of the Holy Trinity fully accomplish in the crucifixion of Jesus? So it's just natural we start with God the Father. We know what God looks down from heaven and sees because we can see it. Oh, so many things we can't see that God sees. But what we can see and what God saw is that he gave us his one and only son. And he was dying unjustly on a Roman cross. Now, I'm sure you've thought about this before, but I don't think any of us could even begin imagining watching one of our own children or, or one of our grandchildren suffer and die in some kind of gruesome, horrible way. It's unthinkable. It's unfathomable. It's fathomless, I guess. I think that's the word. Josh will correct me if I'm wrong. Because we as sinful mortals could never understand, even begin to understand, what it's like to be immortal. Our immortal our holy, perfect Father, surely grieved, but I'm guessing he grieved beyond words that we could ever speak or even understand. What's even more incomprehensible about all this is that God loves you and me so much that he willingly, willingly, without second thought, puts this on his own son. Paul has a unique word that describes that act of love. When in uh, his letter to the church at Corinth, he says words about the Father being the first and the best giver. When he writes that God, God's love in Jesus is described this way. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Using the word indescribable means that we can't. We can't, in our own terms, describe it. Paul is trying to make it clear to us that God's love, can't, that our love can't grasp the heights and the depths and the length and the width of God's love and the gift 
that he gives to us in Jesus Christ. You know, even God's holy angels can't grasp this. Because not having ever sinned, they don't know what it means. They don't know what it feels like to have been redeemed from sin. And then Paul goes on to say that the Father did not spare his own Son, but gave him up for us all. And that God shows his love for us, and while that we were still sinners, and he also uses the word enemies, while we were still sinners and enemies of God, that's when Christ Jesus died for us. You see, the Father doesn't wait for us to clean up our act. We couldn't if we wanted to. He sends his son as a sacrifice, a gruesome sacrifice in our place at Calvary's cross. And what's more is that the father spews out his righteous anger. That's a tough word. That means in large quantities. That means relentlessly spews out his righteous anger towards his son in place of us unrighteous sinners. Jesus handles it. He takes it. God's righteous anger against our sins is his righteous anger against the sins of the whole world. Jesus is the only one that could handle this, that could handle God's righteous anger. That means that we provoked the, the death of Jesus. If he's taking our place, it's obvious, it's our fault. Jesus takes the sin of sinners headed and condemned for hell. But still, he's able to look up to the Father. He looks to his Father's perfect love. His Father, he looks to his Father with unending trust and unbroken faith. And he cries out, my God, why have you forsaken me? After which he then says, it's finished. And then he speaks the words, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And he breathes his last. For he does. He takes one last look at his father's indescribable, incomprehensible, um, immeasurable love. And he dies in the hands of his loving father. He dies like a baby held in the hands of a loving father. What love? What trust? What else did Jesus see as he and the father are looking toward one another? Well, Jesus, from that Good Friday cross, after focusing, or as he focuses his eyes on the Father's love, must now fix his eyes upon us, the ones that give him the reason for being there, the reason he so brutally and shamefully dies there. But he's not got his eyes fixed on our badness. He doesn't have his eyes fixed on our sinfulness, so that he would hold it against us in any kind of way. That's not how indescribable love works. The Lamb of God willingly bears all of this. Jesus wants nothing more than to be our Savior. And as he looks at us, he prays, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He stares right into our sinful eyes, and he says, understand how much I love you. I love you all the same. I and the Father love you so much that together we make this sacrifice for you. I am offering myself willingly under the Father's wrath, and I do it in your place, so that you never, ever, in any way, have to experience and taste what real death tastes like, what hell feels like, much less the Father's judgment against your sins. 
And Jesus says these words. Here's where the Holy Spirit comes in. And Jesus says these words because he knows what the Holy Spirit sees in his suffering and death. What do you think that is? Well, the Holy Spirit sees the Son hanging on the cross. Guess what he does? He comes to Jesus' aid. He comes to Jesus' aid and helps Jesus offer his life as a ransom to the Father. Because after all, this is God's righteous anger that has been handed to him. Now, we don't know the ins and the outs of all this, but I want you to listen carefully to this uh, verse from the epistle of the book of Hebrews, where the writer writes these words, How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself unblemished to God, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself unblemished to God. These words help us to know that as Jesus was going through this whole ordeal on this Good Friday, it was with the help and the power of the Holy Spirit. Here we see the Holy Spirit helping Jesus with such an impossible mission. We know that Jesus received the Holy Spirit without measure in his baptism. We also know that another familiar word for the Holy Spirit is helper. So it makes sense that the Holy Spirit not only helped Jesus fulfill all righteousness during his earthly ministry, he also helped Jesus to offer himself to the Father on that Good Friday cross. Imagine how that might have looked. It's here on this Good Friday that the Spirit sees that everything that is necessary for our salvation is achieved by Jesus. But he helps Jesus to see to it that it is finished. That's why that finished stuff is so important. If it was Jesus who right before his death promised to his disciples and to you and me, and he said these words and made that promise in the upper room, and he told them and us, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. And then he will declare these things to you that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine, and he is going to declare it to you. Three times. Three times while Jesus speaks to his disciples in the upper room on Monday, Thursday. In John chapter 14, in John chapter 15, in John chapter 17. Jesus promises the power and the help of the Holy Spirit. Who helped the disciples to understand what happened on Good Friday's cross and helps us to understand. And so the point I'm trying to make is that through all of this, what we see as we look through the eyes of God or attempt to, what we see is the Holy Trinity working together in a perfect and natural harmony and way. We see that the Father gives the task of redemption to Jesus. We see Jesus willingly take that task upon himself. We see the Holy Spirit helps Jesus to finish that task. And then he joyfully proclaims this message to you and me so that we may know and understand all that we possibly can about what happened on Good Friday's cross. And then now, today, here and now, and in your future, it's the Holy Spirit who takes the work and the righteousness of Jesus and he makes it ours. He helps us to believe it, and he helps us to accept it. He takes the righteousness of Jesus, and he gives it to us in our baptism. The waters of baptism. Those waters are filled with God's grace, and it washes away every ugly sin that Jesus paid for. That's the follow-up work of the Holy Spirit. He also takes forgiveness that Jesus won, for us, and he declares 
that it is finished for Jesus, but it's beginning for us. He declares that we are his redeemed children. It's the Holy Spirit that when once again we will joyfully be able to gather in this church and to celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion, it is the Holy Spirit who helps us to know and believe that in, with, and under the bread and wine, we receive the body and blood of the crucified, risen Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit helps us then to accept what happened there and to receive forgiveness of our sins. On this Good Friday, God sees everything that is necessary for our salvation. Yes, he sees to it that it is finished and complete. What else is finished? The power of sin, Satan, and death and hell in our life. They are finished. Even though we must with our own eyes on this Good Friday, if not any other day of the year, really realize and take a look at our own guilt and our own unworthiness and our shame, the Father fixes his eyes upon you and me, and he sees only Jesus. He sees only Jesus, not our sins. He sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Together, the Father and the Son work out this salvation for us, and the Holy Spirit, gives it to us. He makes us participants in the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're living that right now. And that's why Paul boldly says in his commentary on baptism in Romans chapter 6, we were both crucified with Jesus Christ and we were raised with him in the waters of baptism. He said, well, since you're dead with Christ, you died with him, and since you rose with him, you now live with him, and we now live a certain way, fixing our eyes on Jesus. As we do, we do so knowing that God fixes his eyes on us, and what he sees is the apple of his eye. He sees us, his beloved children who are united with Jesus Christ, who have been renewed in our baptism to live eternal life with him. The Father sees our sins taken by Jesus. The Son looks upon us with his unfathomable love and forgiving mercy. And the Holy Spirit sees to it that Jesus' work is finished and sees to it that somehow we grasp what the triune God has accomplished in this Good Friday cross. The Holy Spirit also sees to it that we live and proclaim what we, by the eyes of faith, have seen. O oh, come, this Good Friday and always, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Amen. We bow our heads as I pray the Good Friday prayer. O merciful God and Father of all, we give thanks for the gift of your Holy Spirit that we have come to know your only begotten Son as the only source of eternal salvation. On this holy day of grieving, we remember before you those who do not know the love and fellowship of Jesus. Send, we pray, your spirit of life also to them. You have committed to us the message of reconciliation. Give us grace to clothe the naked, feed the hungry, comfort the sad and lonely, and awaken those who prosper, bearing witness and word and deed to your love, which has prompted us to care. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. The seven last words Jesus speaks from the cross and the extinguishing of the candles. His first word, as recorded in Mark 15 and Luke 23. And it was the third hour when they crucified him, and with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, 
forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garment. The second word recorded in Mark 15 and also in Luke 23. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God? For we are receiving the due reward of our deeds, justly. You and I are under the same sentence of condemnation. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, Today you will be with me in paradise. Christ the life of all the living, Christ the death of death our foe, who thyself for me once giving to the darkest depths of woe, through thy sufferings, death and merit, I eternal life inherit. Thousand, thousand thanks shall be, dearest Jesus, unto thee. Heart, 
Countless scoffers did surround thee, treating thee with shameful scorn. And with piercing thorns they crowned thee, all disgrace the Lord has borne. That as thine thou mightest own me, and with heavenly glory crown me. Thousand, thousand thanks shall be, dearest Jesus, unto thee. Jesus' third words from the cross recorded in John. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There a precious fountain, free to all a healing stream flows from Calvary's mountain in the cross in the cross be my glory ever till my raptured soul shall find be on the And the fourth word, from Mark chapter 15. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for so? 
such a worm as I, well might the sun in darkness hide and shut his glories in, when God the mighty maker died for his own creature's sin. The fifth word, recorded also in John chapter 19. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scriptures, I thirst. Beneath the cross of Jesus, I fain would take my stand. The shadow of a mighty rock within a weary land, a home within the wilderness, a rest upon the six words as they are recorded in Mark and John. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let's see whether Elijah will come to take him down. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. sacred head now wounded with grief and shame weighed down now scornfully surrounded with thorns thine only crown oh sacred head what glory what bliss till now was thine Yet though despised and gory, I joy to call thee mine. What thou, my Lord, hast suffered was all for sinners' gain. Mine, mine was the 
transgression but thy love deadly pain lo here I fall my Savior tis I deserve thy place look on me with thy favor and grant to me The seventh and final word recorded in Matthew 27 and Luke 23. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and rocks were split. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. In the cross of Christ I glory Towering o'er the wrecks of time, all the light of sacred story gathers round its head of Pain and blessing, pain and pleasure, by the cross are saved. is there that knows no measure, joys that through all time And the last word, recorded in Mark chapter 15 and Matthew 27. And when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have already died. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. And Joseph bought a linen shroud, and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud, and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock. And when it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him, and Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled a great, stro great stone to the entrance of the tomb, and he went away. Let us together very solemnly and in silence whisper the Lord's Prayer together. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. 
trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Sometimes it causes me to tremble. 